Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our very, very last minute webinar that I, I think I got the confirmation text. We were doing this at 829 this morning. So there you go. I would love to hear um, those of you here on Zoom. Uh, it would be great for all three of us to hear before we go Facebook Live. What's on your mind? Uh, what are you hearing uh, about everything with the economy, with real estate? What are you feeling? I'd love to hear if you're excited about it, if you're nervous about it, if you're a little of both. I'd love to hear if you've been through this before <laughs> or if you're newer to the business and this is your first fun, fun, fun turn. We're going to call them fun turn. <laughs> Oh, all right. Uh, why don't you bring us on live, Robin, and um, we will say the same thing to the Facebook group. And Robin, hopefully you can monitor that group too. It's really funny because um, Robin, uh, Robin's got the controls today and I'm not used to that. Hey, Facebook land. I can see that we're live on Facebook. Uh, this is Via Williams with Bang Kinney Companies, with Place, with Empire Building Podcast with her best life and so many other things. I am really, really excited today to have Jesse Pasifume, the president of BKCO Mortgage with us today, and Sarita Dua, who canceled an appointment to be here with us. Uh, Sarita's out of Portland, Oregon, is really one of the top uh, agents in the nation. We uh, figured out we were doing this webinar at 8.29 this morning, and I went on a call at 8.30, which means the prep time, you know, really, we're just going to talk today. Um, we all we all know the Fed just, uh, you know, raised uh, 0.75. I thought it was going to be 0.5. Can't wait to talk to Jesse more about that. That was at 11 a.m. Pacific, and it's noon Pacific, so that just happened. So we're just going to talk today and just kind of talk about what we're um, seeing and and hearing and what, what, what we're understanding in the marketplace. I asked Jesse specifically to kind of come on with his educator teacher hat on to teach us what's happening so that we in turn can, can share that with our clients. And then Sarita and I are going to kind of go into what we're saying to buyers and sellers right now uh, with the agents that we're coaching, teaching, training, and with our own personal production too. So hopefully this will be a very, very uh, informative hour. I, I would hope it would be highly interactive. So if you're on the Pivot Shift Ahead page, welcome. Uh, Robin's going to monitor that. If you have any questions or comments, um, she'll she'll put them back to me. And then if you're on Zoom, um, just feel free to, we'll, we'll look at the chat all throughout the podcast today. So with that said, welcome, you guys. Thank you for letting me pull you on this morning. You're amazing. When Absolutely. Via drafts you, you don't get much of a choice. <laughs> no, there's no choice. But it's hey, awesome. what are you Glad doing at noon? <laughs> we want people to think that I'm nice, right? That's the, you know, we want to smoke in oh, mirrors, but yeah. I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jesse, very nicely. That's a fact. I'm handing the floor to you, my friend. I think you are the man in the moment. I'm really, really excited to just have you kind of walk us through what's happening and um, and how to interpret all this. Yeah, let's do it. So, um Hopefully you can see my screen. All right. So V, are you seeing the graph on the screen there? I can certainly see a graphic. I have no idea what it means, but I see three Ooh. lines. Okay, perfect. So we're there. So see this blue line right here? This is what happened on essentially Friday and wow. And Monday, okay. And this is thirty-year fixed interest rates. We basically that is a went straight from, vertical line for all of you driving. A, literally straight vertical line. In case you can't see it, on Thursday we were sitting at five and a half. We were feeling pretty good about a fifty basis point increase from the Fed. And then on Friday, we believe the Fed leaked to the Wall Street Journal that it could be three quarters, and the market went crazy. We ended up running up to about six and a half uh, on on Friday, and actually for the only the fourth time in history, mortgage-backed securities went no bid on Friday and Monday. So if you were having a tough time with your lender on Friday and Monday, things were pretty chaotic. We had a hard time even getting pricing on Friday and Monday. So things have landed around 6.5, uh, 6 I think 6.6 .6 in some, some instances. So what's so happening just, is- Can I just, before, before you move on, I just wanted to make please. sure that, that, that we're putting a pin in that. Rates went up one point, basically, in one business day, is what I'm hearing. Rates went up 1% in one business day. Okay. 
Has that we ever happened? We haven't seen a move like that in a long time. Uh, it's happened a uh, couple of times, but okay. uh, this one felt a little more significant than last time. Okay. Um, I think 94 was the last time we had a jump that significant over a 24-hour period. Okay. So what's going on is the economy's overheated, unemployment is low, and the stimulus that we had during COVID really just increased the monetary supply, okay? And this is kind of technical stuff, but essentially our economy is absolutely on fire, right? That leads to inflation. So inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years. And everybody thought we were getting a, a, a half a percent increase, 50 basis point increase. What we actually ended up seeing was that on Friday, the inflation numbers were a surprise. We had a couple of things going on. Europe announced that their inflation is higher than they expected. And then on Friday, we saw our inflation numbers driven by the CPI uh, is the number that we watch. CPI was the highest in 40 years at 8.6%. So the Fed really had to act, right? So rates popped up and the end result of that is purchase applications are down, right? So we're all feeling that in the market. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Let's talk about the actual Fed announcement. And oh, by the way, if you want to watch my favorite little application on my iPhone is Mortgage News Daily. They do a good job and you can see what rates are doing on an average 30 year fixed basis. So, you know, you can work with your lender. But at the end of the day, this little Mortgage News Daily app is pretty phenomenal. So let's talk about the Fed announcement. I just I literally hung up. I had to mute my phone to jump on this call because uh, Chairman Powell was speaking. But we had a three quarter point increase. That's the largest since 1994. As of last Thursday, we were at half a percent target. Okay, that inflation number was the big deal. The benchmark target rate for the end of the year is now 3.4%. So from a broader market perspective, when they, when they talked in March, they thought it was gonna be a lot less than that, right? They were in the twos on a target benchmark. So what the Fed has indicated today is they're gonna keep raising rates to deal with inflation. They actually cut the Federal Reserve cut the outlook for the economy's growth by 1.1%, which is incredibly significant. When we start talking about potential recession and, and what's happening next, we need to be watching this number closely. We want to watch the gross domestic product, the GDP number, because that tells us how our economy is performing. And the Fed at this point has cut our outlook for the year. Okay, I'm raising my hand like a student in school. Sorry, right? no, please do. And I'm going to ask the questions that... I'm not going to be too cool for school. I'm going to ask the question. Do it. That, ask that the I question. Understand and if I miss a chat, down. Via, you got to yell at me too. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to go back because where did it go? Um, why would the Fed, will you walk me through like I'm a five-year-old? Why would the Fed, why would raising the rate be a reaction to inflation? I'm not understanding the correlation. Got it. So the rate they're actually the rate they actually increase is called the federal funds rate, right? And it's the benchmark federal funds rate. That's the, the rate at which banks and institutions borrow money from the federal government and then lend it back out. So what they're really doing, and I think I have the next bullet here. Let me pop the next bullet open. There's a role for us in moderating demand. I just typed this while he was, while he was talking about it. The objective of raising this, these rates is they need to moderate demand. And they moderate demand by increasing interest rates. So what happens is your Tesla car, Ford, they borrow billions of dollars to manage their manufacturing process. And they borrow based on this federal funds rate, right? And this is a bit oversimplified, but this is how this works. You know, when you have a, uh, your credit card, your credit card's been running at very, very, very competitive interest rates. Your credit card just went up by, by three quarters of a percent, your credit card interest, which, which means you're likely to spend less money businesses that borrow money at scale, right? Whether you're borrowing money for inventory, like, like automobile manufacturers or borrowing money for operating costs, like some real estate companies, the price of that money just went up. That means you're going to spend less. When you spend less, there's less inflation in the market, right? Less demand. So I don't know what the Wall Street Journal guy is going to say, but the most compelling thing Powell said is that there is a role for us in moderating demand. So we're going to see them continue to increase rates. And what they do is they just make everything so expensive. Just to really simplify this, they just make everything so expensive that you don't buy anymore and there's no longer any inflation, right? And what they're doing is they have to counter the reaction to all of the stimulus money that went into the market over the last couple of years. 
Good, bad, or That's otherwise. That's the best that explanation of that I've ever heard. That, That's the root cause, right? The monetary yeah. supply, the money that's out there from all that, from, from two years of pumping money to soften the blow of COVID and the pandemic and, and, the, and the stimulus packages that were out there. That's part of what this reaction is to us. Well. This is like why inflation got out of hand to begin with. Exactly right. Inflation is driven almost exclusively by monetary supply. Yeah, and there's more more money in the market than there should be. So everyone got their thousand dollar stimulus check and spent it on stuff driving inflation. Now we've got to take care of inflation. Right. Yep, absolutely. So, so this announcement today was was significant because of the 0.75, and because of this comment that they're going to continue moderating demand. So that means that the Fed and, and Powell said it several times that the Fed is gonna work really hard to get inflation back down to its target of 2%. That means making everything harder for us as consumers, okay? It's the only option, right? It's the only option. So that's what happened today on the Fed announcement. Um, now, here's what we need to think about from my perspective in this market. Interest rates went from five and a half to six and a half in one day, maybe even higher. Where they're gonna go uh, we really don't know. The good news is the in, the immediate reaction to this news was largely positive. The Dow's up a little bit. The last time I checked, uh, S and P's up a little bit. This was expected based on this was priced in. You know, you hear people say this is priced into the market. What happens is somebody leaked that there's probably going to be a 75 basis point increase on Friday. That wiped us out. So now we should have some stability for the next week or two. Um, the, the big question that our buyers have and our sellers, right? And, and I'm gonna let you guys talk about this, but there's, there's a couple of data points that are pretty interesting. And if any of you remember 2008 was a bit of a mess, right? And we saw a massive decrease in home values over a very short window of time. And a lot of folks, you know, any of our buyers that are between 37 and, and up, really that's what they're holding on to. And they're like, well, I'm going to get on the sidelines because it's like 2008. There's going to be a real estate collapse. What we're telling people is, I mean, we're grabbing them it's, it's through the Zoom cameras on the shirt and go, no, there's no real estate value collapse here. We have more equity than we've had in history right now. Average of $185,000 per household. Home values could relax by five or 10%. Very little impact to our market. First time home buyer demand is actually staggering. There's 18% more people between 25 and 34 than there was in 2006. 46.1 million households sitting between 25 and 34. The other follow-up statistic to that is that it was something like 8 million of those people make over $75,000 a year and they don't own a home yet. So the first time home buyer, home buyer demand is absolutely incredible. The other thing that we keep hearing about, and I saw like seven or eight tweets today about, ooh, what's going to happen to the institutional investors? Check out this statistic. Institutional investors buying single family homes in 2019, they represented 26.7% of the total purchases. In 2021, 27.6%. So this institutional investor language, I think we need to be very careful with. And when you look at the data points, when you get down deeper into this, you what you what you see is that there's actually the first time home buyer demand swamps any potential investor loss in this market. Okay. The other thing is that this migration has been a huge driver of valuations in in many of our markets, and the migration is going to continue, right? And these are this migration is to the south and the middle primarily, but this migration into the suburbs will continue. The fifth point is that remote work continues to drive demand. Right. And it's driving demand. People are moving a lot more than they used to. And it's driving demand for larger square footage in homes. So we think that as we're talking to buyers, you know, yeah, interest rates are up. They are what they are. Right. But I want you to to really think about the 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 built in price stability in your market. And every market's a little bit different. Like, you know, Boise may drop just a bit. But Bellingham, Washington, where our headquarters is. It's not going anywhere, right? So you need to think about your market. And I'll let, uh, I'll let you guys talk more about that. But for, uh, I'm going to pop this out here, stop sharing my screen. The way 
the way we think about interest rates going forward is that six and a half percent or thereabouts is probably the new normal. Okay. We should be able to sit, we should be able to sit on this for the next couple of weeks. We'll see what happens. But inflation is not going away. So I would not be surprised to see things run up to seven, seven and a half percent over the next 30 to 60 days. So it's the new normal. We need to just we need to we need to work with our buyers and make sure they know they know what's going on. We need to work with our sellers and make sure that they realize that there will be fewer buyers. To give you a data point from our, our list, then I'll shut up via um, from our group of TBDs. We had 30% of our TBDs over the last two weeks, because we actually ran up from five to five and a half kind of gradually. We lost 30, we didn't lose, but 30% of our TBD buyers no longer qualify for the rate they were pre for the home they were pre-approved for. 30%, one out of every three has to reevaluate their purchase strategy. And that's pretty significant when you think about the broader markets. This was super helpful, lots of data. <laughs> That was, well, I mean, that was the best like correlation I've ever had described to me on why the feds, you know, how, how their decisions activate and cool down inflation. Right. I mean, like, I, I think people make these assumptions like, you know, well, we're doing this because of this and we do not understand why, you know, we understand cause effect, but not why. Okay. So the, the question of the hour that I just want to caution anybody watching or listening to is we are not going to get out our crystal balls and tell you what housing appreciation or depreciation is going to do. I think this is a work in progress. We're in the middle of a living story right now, and I'm not going to, I'm just not going to be that speculator. Right. That said, that said, um, there are people uh, a lot of economists, actually, I'm hearing anything from, oh, we're going to cool down to just 10% or 5% or 3% appreciation next year, this year, next year, to we're going to dive in prices up to 40%. I mean, I'm hearing from one gamut to the other. So Jesse, I am kind of curious in your closed door circles and kind of, you know, amongst talk about you guys, what, what would you say is the prevailing, um, not your opinion necessarily, but the prevailing uh, opinion on appreciation versus depreciation in the next 12 to 18 months? Boy, it's, it's almost impossible to answer this question. What we know for sure, Via, is that the underlying fundamentals in most markets support values where they are today. And that wasn't the case in 2008. Uh, I think Tim put a, a comment in the chat, you know, what about, what about luxury? Um, Absolutely. Every market and every price point is going to react a little differently. Um, we have a relationship with Goldman Sachs at place, and you know they believe that we will see 5% national appreciation in 2022. That's revised down from about 13% in January. So they've revised down to 5% appreciation. But it's still the appreciation. Th it's not still appreciation. Yet. It's still exactly going on. Right. Just going like and this instead of kind this. of a kind. I'm going to push back a little bit. Yes and yes, but I'm going to I'm going to push back a little, Sarita, because part of it was the first part of the year was like this. Right. And then it could be like a little plummet. And then that equals out to be 5%. So we could actually be feeling right now a price reduction when in fact, I'm just reminding everybody, right. when in fact, it's still appreciating. It's just adjusting and correcting. There, there's and a couple of things you said, Jesse. You, like one, the two ahas for me is one, there's 18% more first time home buyers today than there was in 2006. And two, that average equity number of $185,000 per household. I have a team member on my team that bought a, a non-conventional mortgage with PMI. He made his 20% appreciation in like a year, like 14 months. So the, yep. the appreciation that he saw so quickly, even at a non-20% down, um, the reality is that that's very different. I've been doing this for 19 years. It's very different than 2008. The reason you had the short sales, the reason you had the foreclosures is A, you didn't have the equity position and B, you could smile and get a loan. That literally stated income was a thing, right? So, but the thing that I'm going to say, and I'm kind of respectfully disagree with some of what you're saying and not, not the facts, but more the emotion part, which is when there's uncertainty, People are turtles. They put their neck back in, in their shell because they don't know what's going to happen. 
And you said it as well, which is even with all of this, inflation is going to still be out of control. And so if we're going to keep playing, as Powell said, the rate card with regards to moderating demand and continuing to raise rates, what happens when 6.5 becomes 8.5 or 10.5? Now we've seen it. There's That's where the mortgage industry gets creative with, with um, first and second loans, with arms, with the buy downs, with all sorts of different programs. Like I love it. Bring it on because that's where we sharpen our saws. We haven't had all sorts of programs like that because we hadn't needed them. But my question becomes in general, now I'm not talking about the 37 plus that remember 2008. I'm talking about my 23 year old first time home buyer or my, you know, or just people that are like, I just, I can't pay $800 more for the same thing. So even if I'm getting a better deal on the house, I'm going to just stay put because I can't afford it. Now I got to go get roommates because I can't, I can't buy anymore. So what do we say to that? I feel like I'm on Squawk Box, by the way. I love it. No, I like it. <laughs> she has a way of putting us on the spot, doesn't she? Um, yes. You know, I think uh, w- what we're telling people is that, listen, every scenario is different. If you, if you are interested in creating equity long-term and owning real estate, you can decide when you want to pay more, basically. That's what this data tells us. Now, we may see a little drop here. You know, we may see home values soften just a little bit, but at the end of the day, real estate continues to trend up and the interest rates go up and go down. We're at a bit of a spike. They could jump again, but one of the side benefits here, and we want to be careful with our crystal ball, but one of the benefits of this for the real estate market long-term is that we will likely end up in some kind of recession. And when that happens, interest rates come back down. So the rate you get today is not the rate you're stuck with forever, most likely, right? And if you need to buy a house, we believe the long-term prospects for the real estate market are very, very good based on that data. Okay, let's stay on that a minute, Jesse. But before you move on to your next point, because that is really, really important point. Because here's the thing, you guys, rents are going, you're paying, you know, as Anton Stetner, one of the best script people I know, as he says, you are always paying a mortgage. The question is, are you paying your landlord's mortgage or are you paying your own mortgage? So for your clients who say, well, our payment's going to go up, guess what? Their rent's probably going to go up maybe 10 to 20%, depending on their market. So it's what's the difference? You might as well be you know, making equity. And by the way, how good are you at sharing that with them? How good are you right now? Do you feel really, really comfortable running them through rent versus own? What the tax ramifications are, how to calculate that? right? All, all, all the benefits that come with that, their payments probably going up no matter what. The other thing is if, you know, if they're stuck with not having a big down payment, down payment programs, uh, some of the state, some of the state, uh, what are those called, Jesse, like the down payment assistance programs? DPA, you know? down payment assistance. Yep. Well, yep. our sellers are going to accept them now, right? No longer are we going to see 17 offers where you can't use those, right? So, you know, my point is, is that is that they're fooling themselves if they think unless they're unless they're actually locked into a two or three year lease. And even then, I don't know why you would I don't know why you wouldn't buy. Certainly, if you guys are compelling enough and you guys are good enough at talking about the value of home ownership versus renting, they should be very compelled to buy. Maybe we should go into that, Jesse. I mean, maybe we should just get into some flat out education on that. Yeah, I think it's time to start educating folks on all of the reasons to own real estate. And the primary the primary conversation we're having is this is in 2008. Mm-hmm. Let me, do you mind if I just throw another quick slide up? And this sure. is not perfect. So this is not 2008. I mean, we just take that and we just throw it away, right? All of you uh, NLP folks, just take that and throw it away. This is in 2008. So what's going to happen next? And again, every market's different. So I'm going to just, that's our, uh, it's like a dance. There you go. Yeah. Just, just, just make it happen. Well, and check yeah, this out. Exactly. This isn't perfect anymore, but uh, I mean, here, here's the here's the real story. If rates increase by a point and a half, which is highly likely, and home value is reduced by ten percent, you're still paying more each month. Everybody should screenshot that. Everybody here should screenshot that. If you are driving, do not screenshot. If you're driving, we will send the replay around. We'll put the replay lives on the Pivot Shift Ahead page anyway. 
And this is really easy to do in Excel with the payment function. And you can show somebody this in real time. Uh, we also do a, a, a broader cost of waiting that's consumer friendly for folks. So this is this is this is part of why, you know, now's a reasonable time. I love this, Jesse, because we're not right now talking about a reduction. So this is super conservative factoring in a 10 percent reduction. My yeah. message to my clients is, look, the market is stabilizing and I am now going back to those buyers that didn't have all cash, weren't in a position to waive every contingency. What I would call my A plus buyers were the only ones we were working with because they were the only ones that stood a chance to in the, in the 12, 17, mm -hmm. 19. You know, 19 offers we had. Now yeah. I can go back to that next tier and say, look, there may be things now that we have access to that we didn't before. And if you right now is the right time to buy, if you don't think you're going anywhere for a few years, I still like your odds, especially when you compare to the uncertainty of, of yearly rent increases and what, you know, what your money will get you on anything else the tax advantages, as well as the stability for buying. And if you predict the rates are going to go down, you get the program that works for you. For example, don't worry about closing costs. Just go for the high rate, knowing that you're going to refi in the next couple of years. Um, and so that's the other thing of like matching your risk aversion with regards to what you think might happen. If you think these rates aren't going to be the lowest, then don't do that 30 year fixed and pay a lot of money for that and yeah. get creative knowing that you can refi into a program that will work long-term. Oh, 1000%. You know, it's interesting to me, the epitome, it, well, it'll be interesting to see if, the, if what I'm about to say is true. So far to me, the epitome of this market versus back in the day, uh, 2000, it was really more 2009 for us in Seattle. I, I know that the, the, in the nation and with everything, it was 2008, we first six months of 2009 will forever be scarred in my memory as the most dismal, freaky six months of real estate I've personally ever been involved in. So I'm a little scarred from that. I So I should say 2008 and not through 2009. I get it, but it feels like 2009. But here's the big difference. Um, my brother, Paul Hermie, runs a very, very large new build, new construction team. They do about 400 units a year. Um, and they have a lot of market share here in Western Washington state. And one of the large national builders, not, not one of their clients cut prices this weekend, two to $400,000, which is about 20 to 25%, a massive price deduction, right? Publicly traded company, large national builder. Here's the difference. What would have happened Sarita and Jesse in 2008 or nine, if a builder did that, they'd still be sitting there, right? Yep. They all sold out immediately. So what they did is they said, okay, we're going to give you the same payment. I know what they did. They said, we're going to give you the, about this. We're going to bring your payment back to what it would have been a few months ago. Right. And we have a bunch of investors. We don't want to freak out because they were, there was, they were trading halts, like, because some of the, the tech prop and FinTech props, sorry, FinTech and prop tech stocks were declining so rapidly there, you know, there's a governor and the stock market will halt trading if it plummets that fast. And so they, they decided, look, let's just sell out of our inventory, not freak out our investors. I'm sure that's what they're thinking and equalize people's payments. And they sold out like that. The buyer demand is so high. There were 10 people this weekend or 15 people in the Seattle area who said, we don't care how high interest rates are. We still want to buy a house. And, you know, and so that to me is probably like one of the most fundamental differences. If they would have done that back then, they would have sat there. Then it would have been freakier and freakier because we would have had a price reduction and sitting inventory. Now you do that and you're going to still sell like that because the demand is so high. Yeah, we have another um, new home build in the Seattle market that we're working with and they are offering $45,000, $50,000 in interest rate buy down. So yeah. same exact concept, right? So we're pulling a jumbo interest rate from six and a quarter down, you know, down to 5% and they're advertising the 5% and offers are coming in hey, right? Jesse, where they were sitting on the home. On the will you explain to us why are jumbo rates better than conventional right now? Well, it depends on the day. So the, um, it, it all depends on the secondary market. So right now, MBSs are really struggling, right? The mortgage-backed securities are really struggling to find their footing. And jumbo investors are largely portfolio investors. It's a different type of security. So what you'll see is these, these rates will, will go up and down. And some days, jumbo is a quarter better. 
you know, or a three eighths better. Uh, the challenge is that getting a jumbo loan approved is much more complicated, right? So it's the highest level of credit, uh, you know, credit risk that we have. Um, so we'll, we'll, it's just, it's a weird time right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That should, it it won't be consistent, but right now today, there's MBS is having a hard time finding the footing on the third year. There's a question here and it's a gear switch, but it's not, I think it's a great question, which is why would a seller sell if they are giving up this great rate that they have, let's say they have 2.75 or under three because they've refied. Because I think for me, 100% of the people I know refied during the pandemic because they could. Um, and so why would a seller give up that low rate for a higher rate? Will they sell or will they stay put? And the reason I want to have that conversation is it affects inventory and it affects it affects what's available if if people stay put there's fewer homes for buyers and then we still may have a shortage of housing so um and have an inventory situation so jesse what are your thoughts there and then what you know what can we expect for you know i have some thoughts in general which is just that people move for reasons that are not related to money <laughs> like Hi. they don't need to that's commute, the answer you know like Listen, you know, Every single one of these scenarios will apply to individuals, you know, to, to individual markets and individuals differently, right? So some folks, you might, you might talk to them and if they don't have a need, they don't need to move. They can sit tight, right? Which is an issue. We don't want to convince people to leave a house they're comfortable in with a rate that, that's solid. However, the answer to that question is, yeah, but interest rates are always temporary. They go up and down. So what you get to do is you get to take advantage. Don't worry about your low rate. You're taking advantage of the equity that you've built over the last two years in this house, right? And that allows you to leverage that equity into the next home, whether it's a move up, move down, whatever that next home is, you're leveraging that equity and moving that equity forward. Interest rates, interest rates are higher, but guess what? They're going to come back down eventually. And at the end of the day, there's, you know, the tax write-offs and other, other things associated with it. And you get to build more equity. So if you end up moving from a $300,000 house to a $600,000 house and you get 5% appreciation, you've built your equity accelerates, right? You're better at, at this speech than me, but you're basically trading up, using your equity trading up, and then, you know, your equity position will grow faster, your net worth will grow faster. Always. It's less about the interest rate. Yeah. Um, the, I love that you asked that question, Sarita, or someone asked it, because I think we should spend a, a couple minutes on that, because this is now us kind of in the, I want you guys to hear this discussion and think, okay, how can I translate this to conversations with my client? Right. So what we're doing is having the conversation so that you can hear how to word things for your clients. Right. So, so a couple of things on that. Number one, if you're trading an asset for an asset, what we're really talking about is loan servicing cost. And, and Jesse, you're hundred percent, right. 10% less 10% is easier math for my 10% of a $600,000 house is, you know, 60,000, 10% of a $300,000 house is 30,000. So, you know, from a, from a sheer dollar standpoint, you're always going to increase your net worth more, right. With a higher price asset. Number one, number two, let's say that they're, let's just use easy math for Via. Let's just say that their loan payment, that their monthly payment is going to go up five hundred dollars uh, now if they go and buy a six hundred thousand dollar house i'm making up numbers doesn't matter so yeah so the conversation sarita that i just have with a client is i said well let's talk about it here's the deal if your payment's $500 more, that means you'll be paying $6,000 a year more for this house, okay? And it's priced at 625. So let's span that out over two years because, you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to refinance in a couple of years out of that, right? So that would be 6,000 a year, that's $12,000. So this house is priced at 625. Would you be comfortable coming in at 610? which is 15,000 lower than that and making up. So that Delta of $15,000, yeah, you're going to pay for that in extra payments, but you're going to get a fantastic house that you really wouldn't have been in a position to get six months ago because you're going to, we're going to be able to write an offer contingent on the sale of your house now. Right. So as long as you understand the numbers and how to translate it, I just own it. I don't even, Sarita, I don't even push the objection. I'm like, yeah, for sure. So you're going to be spending 6,000 extra a year on this house. Let's calculate how much out you're comfortable. Maybe it's three years, right? $18,000. Let's take that off the price and bake it in. 
Yeah. The other thing we're saying is like, at the end of the day, it's all about motivation, right? Like, so why are people buying? Why are people selling? I I start this conversation with, with all of our clients of like, look, the last two years, we've all realized what home means to us. Um, literally the way we live, the way we leave the home, the way we exercise, it's our office, it's our gym, it's, it's, you know, even the spaces that we have, right? And if you don't have to go into work ever anymore, or just a couple of days a week, then guess what commute doesn't matter either. And so we've now decided that like, we're not settling Mo- gone are the days where you live in a, in a city, you don't want to live in, to, live in because your company transferred you there. People pick the way they live and then work as a part of that. And so the, the challenge we've had is we've all been falling all over ourselves with regards to, you see the house, there's an offer deadline, there's offers in, you don't want to miss it. We're literally, we're spending less time putting an offer together than, than at a restaurant placing a food order. Like it was, it was so ridiculous that we didn't have time to really understand motivation on the buy side and the sell side. What are they selling? What's their next chapter? Where are they moving to? We always need to talk about that. Like, what does this sell represent to them? And so those are the conversations that, you know, I, I think what's happening, a lot of us agents, we're, we're, we're getting a little caught up with the, the noise and the distraction. And we're now spending more time talking about this than actually translating it to what are the conversations we need to have immediately with our clients and our prospects. And that those are the conversations that we need to have as opposed to, oh my gosh, Mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to wake up. I don't want to look at the stock market. I don't want to look at the announcement. I don't know what this means. So I'm not going to work. Um, it's just, this is just skills. This is good old fashioned skills with regards to finding the motivated. You don't need to convince anyone. Uh, I use this phrase. You don't need to push people in the pool. There's already people in the pool swimming. Those are the people we need to find. We don't need to convince yeah. people that this is the market. Yeah. For them. Yeah, I love that. I think this is the time, guys, to lay off of percentages and lay on to more dollar talk. So you notice when I gave my my script, it was five hundred dollars a month. Let's translate that into six thousand a year. Let's say you're going to re- let, let's be conservative and say it's not going to be three years till you can refinance into a really great rate, right? So you, you don't hear me using percentages. I'm using real dollars as it relates to them, right? I think it's just the market for that. How it's it's how this translates and what the impact is on them is what we need to focus on their personal economy, right? This is where Main Street is our focus, not Wall Street, because that's all noise. And it's kind of, frankly, kind of irrelevant until it's relevant. Right. So I just think that throwing around all these percentages, it doesn't mean anything. It's not a real dollar amount to them. But when you say your payment's going to be 382 more, that is true. That is like, I don't even fight that objection. I bet you there's a lot of sales trainers who would say that is the worst thing in the world. Why would you say that? I, I, that's just how I am with my clients. I'm just super direct and super transparent. So let's talk about these facts and the data. And then you make the decision, Mr. Client, right? You're going to make this decision. Let's, let's map it out. Let's talk about the tax benefits. Let's talk about all of this. And ultimately my job is to give you the data and your job is to make the decision. And I support you. And that's how I work with my clients. I don't know about you, Sarita, but. No, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no, we don't need to sugarcoat it. We just need to translate it into terms that make sense to them. Yeah. I think sometimes as agents, like don't own this, tr- you're, you're, you're a messenger. Like you don't have to shoulder, you don't have to feel bad. Your, your job is to give them the facts and data they need and their jobs to make the decision, right? Make you know? for decision. Absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah, a hundred question here uh, about sellers. Would you list now or would you wait? Well, um, I am listing my personal house um, soon in the next 30, 40 days. And by the way, guys, I just bought a house. So, you know. I, so this is my thing. We used to have a phrase back in 08, 09, uh, when the market shifted like this before. It didn't shift like overnight, but it absolutely went from a seller's market to a buyer's market. And the phrase was, it's a price war and a beauty contest. Um, the, the homes for sale had to be the best looking, that's the beauty contest, but they also had to be priced really well. And what I'm telling my sellers is, Hey, I don't care about perfect. Like in terms of like, Oh, I want to paint this room or whatever. Like we can give the paint credit, but like, let's get it on the market because what's happening now and what I'm seeing at, cause I'm in my 19 years, I haven't seen this is the fastest slowdown I've seen. Like it yeah, literally I agree. breaks. It's whiplash actually. Right? And yeah. so 
what we're seeing is this price cutting to the bottom that's happening for certain properties. Now, what's interesting in our market in Portland, Oregon, is some of it is still multiple offers and cash wins and waiving contingencies and all that. But when this price cutting starts, what I'm telling my sellers is get on, get it sold, get out. Um, also, like it's kind of like a taxi meter. If it's going to take a little longer with regards to days on the market, let's get that meter running. And because what you don't want is some doofus that lives on your street that was so desperate that they underpriced it out of set the curve for the neighborhood because that's the comp now too. And so, you know, where we can with sellers, I'm saying, let's get it going right now, right away. And then with buyers, the conversation is again, re-engaging. Like I mentioned, the market is stabilizing. There may be opportunity. Let's talk. I, we're re we're doing a re -strat I call them strategy sessions instead of cons consults. We're doing those strategies, strategy sessions again, because we're just whatever we said before and whatever they said before might be out the window. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Really, really well said, Sarita. For all of you guys who are working with sellers that are coming up. So you're, you're in that house prep mode right now where you've given them a range, you know, and you're kind of in that, that delta of time when they're getting their house ready, whatever. I have, I have a few of those, right? Up and coming soons. Um, don't be shy, guys. You gave them pricing using the, the knowledge and the information you had one week ago, two weeks ago, two months ago, right? You've got to just, you know, pull up your pants and go be a big girl or big boy and have some strategy sessions with them now upstream and let them know what they're walking into. Because what you don't want is that horrible stress. You told me my house was worth 600 and, and now we go on the market and no one's here. And now we're hearing 525, 550 and they get angry. But if you, if you sit down with them and say, Hey, the market is shifting in front of our eyes. It's a moving target. Here's what's happening. Um, we're going to tracking every day. And, you know, these are the conversations I'm having. Hey, we're tracking this every day. I'm sure you've heard the news. Uh, no, but then they go listen to the news. Let me tell you, you know, so, so you just have to be sure that you're going as upstream as possible and managing expectations with your sellers right now. And for all of you newer agents, I have news for you. Get ready. You will be, you, you need to upfront the first 10 days of a listing. My advice is to contact your seller once a business day for the first two weeks because you're just not used to it. And I, I know you don't understand if you do that and then you get into weekly and a couple, you know, every other day check-ins, you won't be as stressed as the agents who kind of retreat back and don't communicate with their sellers. Right. Sarita, we've both been there. We have to change our tactics, right? We used to be, I mean, we used to be like, get out of town. I'll be gone. I'll be pending on Sunday, right? We used to yeah. drop the listing on Thursday, you know, yeah. open out, you know, very, we had a strategy. It's that strategy has changed. Now I tell them, I have to tell them up front, look, you're welcome to go out of town because obviously it's easier for showings, but you may go out of town and there may be none, or they may be a handful. It's your call if you want to spend the weekend in a hotel or not. But the reason we have to have those conversations, because when it doesn't sell, it's still your fault. And, and so you have to tell them with anecdotes, as well as just real data on exactly what's happening and what, you know, how we're shifting. We're seeing price reductions come back. We're talking about price reductions up front. We're, we're seeing broker tours come back, which we weren't doing as often because we were doing these sort of weekend frenzy listings. So it depends on the market, of course, and the price point. But um, but expectation is key. Otherwise it is your fault. You didn't prep them properly. So I, I love Dave Peter. He does comment slash question. He, he was like, sellers are acting as if it's a full blown buyer's market. Some reducing prices in less than a week because I don't have five offers in the first few days. Can enough of this emotional action further impact home values? So I love that Dave. So I actually think that's great. I don't mind that all that is to me is a fast moving market and a fast adjustment. It, you know, the market always equalizes, right? Buyers will buy at the top of what they think value is. Sellers will sell at the bottom. That is market value, right? That is assuming an arm's length transaction. So you're, I, I think you, I don't correlate speed with a negative thing. To me, that's great. I have been selling in times where it took sellers months to accept a price reduction. So for me, you know, having them calibrate really quickly and understanding that they just need to go down in five days, to me, that's not a negative. What do you think, Sarita? Same, it's a motivated seller. There's, I mean, you're not gonna affect every appraisal and not everybody's doing it. So you may have one person that's just like, 
I've made enough money. I need to move on. This sale represents my family being back in the same zip code and I'm just going to get it done. And that doesn't necessarily equal a, a new basis for that whole neighborhood. But the, okay. the comment I made though, is that if you are on the market with someone like that, you just like, I have one right now, we went pending at full price and we just held our ground and we're watching our neighbor like continue to drop. And now honestly, everyone thinks something's wrong with that house. So like, you know, we, we know our value. We are also, the reality is it's a house. It isn't a sandwich, like I said, and it, it used to take three or four months. We're just so so wired to think if it's after three or four days, something's wrong in our house or us, we're losers, right? And that's not the case. So okay, so Rita, you said, I'm going to push back on something actually you said, yeah. hoo, 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 drama yeah. on the webinar, yeah. um, which is, you know, you were like, ah, oh, just get it on the market. We're going to give a seller a paint credit or something, right? Because someone just asked on chat about, you know, yeah. does this affect how sellers invest in their house? I would argue the more we move into a neutral and maybe even a buyer's market eventually, the more we move into that, I would argue it's even more important to do house prep, actually. So I would argue the opposite, that it's it's even more pertinent because there's, there is more inventory. There are more so choices. Let me let me defend my comment. Absolutely. You, back to the beauty contest coming, you have to look the best. My challenge is with contractors, at least in our market, not being available if there's something that can easily be explained and now we don't have to wait four weeks because we're waiting for a contractor to do some work. For example, in this case, honestly, the one room is blue. They just want to paint it to a neutral color. And we're oh, like, yeah. the buyer gets to pick the color for this room. We've already got the painter. So yeah, that's different. Paint, right. Yeah. But no, but like things like if you need to remodel, like if it's like a, a deck or some, something that's isolated that we can explain with a credit or that it will be done prior to close, um, even hardwood floors, like, Hey, we're refinishing these. It's going to be, it's going to be done when the seller moves out. That's something that I think you can explain mm -hmm. and actually save weeks, if not months on your listing timeline. Yeah. Can the sellers are like, literally I had one that like, she was doing every nail pop, everything perfect. She literally missed this around in our market around mother's day. It really started slowing down. And she missed the window by two or three weeks because she was going for perfection where honestly a nail pop wouldn't have mattered. So, um, so just a matter of like the degree of perfect and how much can we explain, but absolutely. I take full responsibility for your pushback there. It does have to look good. And it just, it has to be something that we can easily explain and make it as a benefit, right? Hey, the buyer gets to pick the color they want instead of us doing, you know, crisp white by yeah. Miller. Well, and I, I totally agree with that advice, everything you just said. So that's good. Candace asked a really good question. You know, what about sellers who can't seem to get over the past and, and think this market is the last year's, you know, couple of years market. And, you know, she's asking like, what are the best data and tools to show them, you know, what's happening in the marketplace? I know what I use. What, what do you use, Sarita? I put them on a search as if they're buying their own home. And I want them to see the prices, the price reductions, the quality and condition of who they're competing with. They need to see it uh, more than just me telling them. And usually they're the ones who bring up the price being wrong or a price reduction being needed because the market's educating them, not us. Yeah. The other thing is these ones that, I mean, at least for me, like if you're not getting showings, we are off by a large percentage, right? Like it's one thing to get showings and not get offers, but you're not getting showings at all. I get narrow market properties. That's what I call them. You know, that that one property that's 11,000 square feet and there's like two buyers total for it. But if it's not like a super narrow market property and we are just not getting the showings, the only thing we can change is price. It's not, when they say it's the house or the price, it's the price. The price is what's going to move it. Yeah, I love that. I use Trend Graphics. I've used Trend Graphics, Candace, for almost 20 years. And, I, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. I, I think Info Sparks, I think there's a lot of, of charts, but I sort of think, I think I read somewhere that 60 or 70% of the population is visual. And so I think there's, I think a chart makes a lot of sense. My little via rule on that, and we have a great webinar. Um, I think I did it with Seychelle Robin, if you're looking for it, but we did a great webinar on how to, how to talk data to your clients, which we'll try to dredge up. And my little rule is no more than two data points. So I, people, maybe three, sometimes three, Jesse's was good because it was three distinct lines. That was fine. But I try to, I try to make it not overly complicated. And so trend graphics is great because it has real time data. 
up to the day before. Um, and so it shows me immediately, um, you know, whatever data points I'm looking at. So, and, and plus, I think you just get comfortable. I've been looking at the same, I've been looking at trend graphic for almost 20 years. So for me, I just know it. I'm not sort of selling trend graphics. I am selling sting on one thing though, like for the long haul. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I'm going to jump in here. Say. Yeah, I can tell. He's I think like, there's three. I know you guys, I don't know if I should jump in or what. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a couple of things that, that, that we do. And I think there's three data points that are really interesting that we are talking to people about consistently. Number one is inventory in your market, right? Which you should be able to get trend graphics or just from your local MLS. What do the inventory numbers look like? Cause that, that, you know, the abundance of choice is we're, we're nearing an abundance of choice that we haven't had in the last couple of years. Number two, uh, the number of immediate sales, you can see that number has dropped by 50 or 60%, right? In most markets. So not everywhere. Portland's kind of an exception right now. Uh, but the number of immediate sales has dropped uh, pretty significantly. And then um, the third one is the number of price reductions per week. And that data comes from trend graphics or, or anywhere. You know, what I do is I follow a couple of people on Twitter. You can find folks like in Sacramento, there's a great real estate appraiser that has a great Twitter feed and he pulls this data together. Um, so I, I love, so trend graphics is phenomenal. I get on Twitter, follow a couple of decent people. They put the graphics up. We can steal those graphics and use them. Uh, there was another question here about builders offering rate buy downs out of the gate. We are absolutely doing that on resale properties today. Okay. Yeah. And there's a couple of ways to do it. I'm not going to go too far because I think we're running short on time, but we, um, you can offer a seller paid two, one buy down where you basically come up with, you know, somewhere between two and $6,000, your seller comes up with two to $6,000. And if the rate's six and a half today, they're going to start at four and a half, right? And you can offer that, you can market it, you can advertise it, you can put it on a financing flyer. You can also just offer a seller credit for rate buy down to actually buy the rate down to where it was last week. And we're seeing that happen quite often as well. So it's time to get a little more creative on your listings, right? To create demand, uh, generate your own demand. And then you can maintain, you know, instead of doing a $40,000 price reduction on a luxury home, you know, offer a 5% jumbo rate, right? Advertise that 5% jumbo rate. A, it increases traffic. And B, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll bring more buyers to the table and show them that there are options. So we're seeing well, yeah, a lot of and that. Remember and remember, buyers can write it in too, right? You can just yeah. write it in and, and, and help the listing agent explain it to their seller in a well-drafted cover letter. Like, hey, I know this, you know, I know this, this house is listed at a million dollars. We're offering, you know, a million twenty and a seller in the seller credit closing cost for twenty thousand dollars, so that we can buy the rate down. That is, so the net is the same that you want, you know, whatever. So you got it. Yep. Yeah. Time to get creative, right? No longer listen on Friday. Sell it by Monday. That's right. Sarita, what else in our, our time we have remaining, I feel like we should kind of address, you know, how, how we're, we have throughout the thing, but, you know, anything to add with how, how we're talking to buyers and, and kind of getting buyers off the fence with higher payments besides what we've already said? Well, I just maybe to back up one step before we think about the messaging of buyers is how do we message for ourselves? I, I think the main thing right now is staying positive, making sure we focus on what is the opportunity. There's always opportunity in any market. Mm -hmm. So, and what we're doing is just humans in general, we always compare it to how things were and that's, and then we have recency effects. So that's all we remember, but like in every market, there's an opportunity. And this one, for example, there's an opportunity for buyers to actually not have to overpay to get a house. Um, so what are the opportunities? And then the other thing I would say is being very connected to agents. I think agent communities, agent spheres, agent tribes, whatever you want to call them, and different groups are better, like not just one, but multiple different groups that you're part of, whether it's an office mastermind or an affiliation that you're part of or a coaching organization or anything else, finding those people that you can just really be transparent with on like, what are you guys seeing? Or I have this opportunity. I don't even know if I should go for it. What do you guys think? Right. And so sometimes not being in your market, but being able to have a trusted advisor that you can bounce things off of, that's actually been really helpful because that's where we're getting uh, one different levels of experience, different risk profiles, but as well as different markets, right? So we're hearing what people are doing in different markets, and then we can apply that on what it means to our clients. So I think those two things are really important because it's very easy to get negative 
And there's a lot of fear out there for agents like, oh, now the party's over. Yeah. You know what? If you're those that agent that just your marketing plan was putting a listing in MLS and printing out the black and white MLS printout and that's your flyer. Yes. <laughs> the market, the party is over. Like that's not going to work anymore. And so, but, but sharpening our skills is what's going to set us apart. And there will be a, a good amount of agents that just haven't been in a market like this. And they're either going to strive to the occasion or they're going to probably self-select out. And so there's opportunity here even to, to gain market share, but we just need to understand what our clients want. So that's, I think, how I, I really want to make sure we don't lose those right. points. But with regards to buyers, absolutely. I feel like I think we recapped almost everything that I'm doing today with the buyers. Well, that, that was really smart and well said. I, I think that, you know, if I was going to add anything to that is that our our duty and our jobs, right? I mean, we, we want to be real estate wealth advisors, right? That's that's the role that I, certainly I take on with my clients, right? They legitimately at call and ask me what my opinion is on timing, on the market. I get I get those questions all the time. That tells me that the 20 years I've invested in this, you know, career that that it's paid off, that they're viewing me that way. And that's, that's my hope for all of you guys. But our job is to give data driven, responsive, informative, data-driven responses, not emotionally. Yeah, it's a great time. Yeah, I think you should, I think you should sell. What? What? No, let's go through the data. Let's go through the market, right? Now, it's not that it's not that in a close relationship we don't say those words. It's just that's an informed response based on data and research and understanding the market and understanding what their motivation is. Sarita did a really good job, I think, enumerating that. This is a this is a you know whatever they're motivated by. Like this market, you know, Mrs. Seller, this market may seem a little daunting. It's probably going to get you on the golf course, my friend. So uh, do you want to, you know, are you, are you interested in getting on the golf course for an extra 6,000 in payments this year, but we can get you on the golf course for, you know, cheaper than we could have ever dreamt over the last like six or 12 months, because this is our moment. And by the way, you may not have to sell your house before we do it. Right. So, you know, are you going to look back on this time and just hit yourself that you didn't do it? That's only for you to answer. Right. You know, what, what I would say is, is there, there were many, many clients of mine who saw the frenzy over the last few years kicking themselves that they didn't make purchases 10 years ago when the market was soft, right? I mean, you know, just, just ask yourself, how secure are you in your job? And, and oh, by the way, I know it feels stressful, but you're going to have to, would you miss rent? You wouldn't miss rent. Why would you miss a mortgage? What's the, you're not going to probably miss your monthly payment no matter where you live, right? So, you know, I have those kind of conversations with my clients because I, I have pretty close relationships with them. Jesse, real quick, your take on luxury, second homes, what segments do you mm. think are, are going to potentially be impacted? I think um, second homes due to combination of the moves that were made earlier in the year where we increase rates dramatically and then you, comp, you, put, you layer this rate increase uh, on top. I mean, that second home market, if you wanted to originate a second home mortgage today, it's pretty much locked up. I mean, you'd have to pay five points. That's going to change. But I think that is going to have, uh, that's going to be the market that's most impacted or second homes. From a luxury perspective, it is definitely, um, I wouldn't sit on your luxury property and I'd really be looking at financing options, you know, offering solid financing options or, or seller credits, but that's really market dependent. You know, we see, um, I think the luxury market softening in some areas and in other areas, it is as strong as it's ever been. So it depends on what, what your, your particular market you know, that's my segment. At least I, I'm, I, I'm what I call entry level luxury. Like I'm kind of like that move up into entry level luxury. I have to tell you, I am not that market to me is it doesn't feel like it's going to get affected. Now a feeling is not a data point. I, I grant you, but my clients, that market seems extraordinarily stable. Their businesses, their employment feels very stable. This, this to me, it's more a choice of where they're putting what their asset classes are. Like for instance, where it'll be effective, it, you know, it'll be impacted by the market. The stock market always, you know, drives that to a certain extent, especially, you know, our friend Sue Adler in, in New Jersey that relies on Wall Street bonuses, you know, for, for certain purchases, it'll affect that. But honestly, a lot of my business owner clients and everything are thriving right now. Um, home is more important than ever to them. Uh, you know, if, if they were going to, if they were going to liquidate though, Jesse, you know, stock, 
right now to go buy that purchase. You're right. That, that, that is when it gets affected. So, well, um, I, uh, I want to thank you guys. You know, I pulled you on very, very last minute and I, I hope this was informative to everybody. I am really excited to share that Chris Suarez, the, uh, founder of place, um, and really national, um, you know, one of the most um, well-known national real estate voices and thought leaders is going to join us live next Wednesday at 11, a slightly different time. Uh, Robin, this is news to you, <laughs> but we're going to do our webinar next week, next Wednesday at 11, so that we can get Chris on live. He's going to bring on some uh, stats from, well, not so much proprietary because this is public, but from Goldman Sachs. Um, and, uh, and talk about, you know, how he's seeing it, uh, on his level, what, what, what our top teams, uh, are doing at place, what kind of measures we're taking, um, scripts, things that work, uh, Chris is phenomenal. So I'm really, really, uh, pleased and happy that he's going to be joining us. Uh, he's a guest I don't get a lot. So hopefully you guys can, uh, can join us live next week, slightly different time, but that's okay. We're just going to roll with it. That's just what we do. So thanks everybody for joining us. A big, huge, please join me. A big, huge special thanks to Jesse and Sarita today. <laughs>